nice introduction and also a comp. Um, nice uh, uh, introduction and compliment uh, to what I'm going to talk about, um, which is going to look sort of below the surface of these media. Um, uh, it's also made me feel a bit old uh, when Brett is talking about 1995, because in 1975, <laughs> I was part of a project called, I led, led the project called Community Memory, which set up the first storefront online access, community access, on um, at First and Burrard, uh, right next to where Whole Foods used to be. So if you lived here then, back then, um, most of you don't look like you did. <laughs> um, uh, that was also inspired by the same kind of, of, um, of uh, sort of principles and ideals of, of open access and sharing. That was well before uh, internet that we were using um, you know, dial-up modems. But it was a basic idea of a social media that you could uh, post uh, things to and share um, openly with. Um, and um, but since then, I've, I've both been interested in community networking, but also, I would say, the dark side of this universal um, access, uh, universal uh, communications medium, because um, as uh, Brett has been talking about, uh, large corporations have certainly taken a great interest in that, <coughs> um, but also uh, particularly our uh, security agencies, and um, and this has been a boon to them. And uh, since uh, well, I guess 2008, I've been uh, looking at. What happens to your data? Does it go through the sites of um, where it can be intercepted in the United States? And I'm not going to talk about what happens with the Canadian security establishment because it's also a part of the NSA. Um, we can talk about that maybe uh, later. Um, but if if we're going to have any hope of dealing with it, we first of all have to you know um, keep our data at home, where we at least only got one jurisdiction, one set of uh, spooks to deal with. Uh, so, I'm going to try and take you sort of below the, below the, um, well, sort of behind the scenes, behind the walls, um, into the wire, so to speak. And um, just inspired by the, um, by that 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 movie, uh, that, uh, the, that that video, uh, you, I just I thought I would see if I could find examples of root in our database, and I'll talk more about this, that do exactly this. And so um, this is a, from, our, from our mapping system. And this is showing approximately, there's some, there's some differences, but a route between um, uh, someone, actually it was in Campbell River, but um, that is heading to the uh, Metro Vancouver website. And it gets handed off in, in um, I almost said Chicago because I was sort of working in Toronto, and that's where most of them would go. But in this case, it's, it's Seattle. And Seattle is one of the prime places where the NSA, with very reason to believe, has put in their interception equipment. Uh, so it comes back to, um, uh, to Canada. Um, and it's not just Shaw. We, we can see signs of, of uh, TELUS doing um, exactly the same thing. And um, uh, so why is that happening? Uh, what can you do about it? Uh, that's the kind of uh, thing that we're doing the research on. But, but we're also just trying to help people understand what's going on behind the scenes um, to your data. Um, the idea of the internet as a cloud um, is, uh, is a mystifying one. And I would say that it's a, it's a offers a, a dangerous misconception um, to how things actually work. And um, if we want to get uh, to grips with uh, with this form of espionage um, and surveillance, then we have to understand what, what's going on. So, a uh, little bit of, of introduction to the uh, surveillance uh, by the uh, National Security Agency and its five eyes partners, uh, including our on the CSE, but uh, focus on NSA because they are the leaders here, and uh, we know much more about them thanks to Edward Snowden and I'll be showing some images from uh, the Snowden. Um, document that he released. Uh, it was great that Brett uh, mentioned the PRISM program. That's the one with that wonderful arrow going up into the future of the, the nine um, social media companies. $20 million a year, a bargoon. Um, but while for many people uh, 
what you do on Facebook or Twitter or those other accounts will be very revealing. Not everything goes on there. In fact, a lot of people and a lot of transactions don't um, go through that. Um, and this is a slide to, to analysts saying, don't just look at Prism, look at upstream. And upstream is the, is the sort of the broad category of all of the programs that the NSA has for being able to intercept traffic on the fly. It's like wiretapping rather than going into the, into the files itself. Much harder to do technically, because uh, it's going by you know, 10 gigabits <coughs> per second, and you've got to read the seven <coughs> packets and, and so on. So it's like trying to make sense out of, uh, out of a water hose, a fire hose of this. But if you can do it, then you've got everything, right? Every uh, packet. Um, and there's a lot of other stuff um, in there that they can capture and analyze. Um, and they do this all around the world. This is um, this the the picture that they've bought, that they developed themselves, uh, formerly secret, um, that shows their various types of surveillance programs, their interception points, uh, various kinds, um, some with with with, uh, with the telecom companies, some in partnership with companies, and uh, some are just are clandestine intercepts to to uh, to fiber optic cables. Um, so it's this is much more than twenty million dollars a year, and um, it's in the tens of billions of dollars to to develop this kind of worldwide um, apparatus. Um, one of the things I want to draw attention to, um, because it's not just surveillance now, it's not just that they can see what you what you're doing, but this thing called CNE, uh, computer network uh, exploits, that is where they implant spyware on devices, on routers, or on your own machine. Um, and they can do that when they can intercept your traffic going through one of these, um, these routing centers. Uh, that's a program called uh, Quantum Insert. There's all kinds of weird names they've chosen. But basically, this is a man-in-the-middle attack. So that if your data is passing through one of their interception points and you are on the list of someone that they are interested in doing something with, either to find out more about it so that they can install spyware or to interfere uh, with your machine or shut it down or, or whatever, then they can detect when you come online and you access a website. And before that website can respond, it sends back the response and um, injects their implants, in, in this case, um, implants the, the, uh, the spyware. Uh, so even if your system is encrypted, it can put in, say, a keystroke um, uh, logger, so it can actually just get the keystrokes before it's encrypted. So um, uh, at, at that, that slide I showed you was from years ago now. Um, there were 50,000 of these around the world. But this um, stuff at the bottom, they were very pleased about this turmoil and turbine allows this to be automated. So you put in a selector, basically, and if, you, if your IP address shows up, then they can um, inject that stuff uh, into, your, into your machine. So it's not just a surveillance. It's, um, it's, a, well, it's an interference program, or what they call it, or an exploit. Um, uh, so this is why it's concerning, um, sort of doubly concerning. It's not just they're watching that, that they can do things to you. Now this started, I mean, the first exposure of this program came in 2006 when um, the former AT&T technician, Mark Klein, who worked in this um, rather ominous windowless building, um, which is the AT&T's major main gateway in San Francisco. Uh, and uh, he documented the existence of the splitter operation where it basically takes all of the traffic that's all flowing through these cables by putting splitters half a silver mirror and stick them into uh, the machine, which is in the secret room, uh, 641A. Um, and that's where the NSA gets access to it. It, can, it uh, then forwards it to um, its uh, data centers. It can analyze it um, and so on. Uh, this is uh, the FF's uh, infographic to describe that, basically. Um, so if your traffic goes through one of their centers, it will be captured. They can, it will be captured, and you know, we can't tell exactly what they do with it, but they can store all of it 
for days, and they filter it and and analyze it for threat profiles to see whether you know based on the kinds of profiles that you saw uh, Brett describing. Um, not so much about your propensity as whether you're going to pay back a, a loan or not, but whether you're considered a risk to the state in, by whatever categories they, they come up with. Um, then uh, you can be uh, you can be targeted. So the project that I took on was a kind of counter surveillance one, which is to be able to help people see, as myself to begin with, whether my data, your data, went through such places. Um, so first of all, we had to find out where they were. <coughs> And then, um, and then uh, track them through a thing called trace routes. So this is the the the, the future website of, for the XMAPS project, which is we're going to be revealing it next <laughs> month, I hope. Um, and it's it's a, we see it as sort of a general tool to help you understand um, this uh, this phenomenon of, of routing and the privacy risk. It, it's not nearly, I'm afraid, as, as catchy and, and dynamic as as Brett's uh, wonderful. Um, uh, a video is, um, but it does show you this other side. So today I'm just going to talk very briefly about these these two um, aspects, um, inter NSA interception and this phenomenon of boomerang routing. So um, these are the sites that back in 2010 we, we um, estimated, uh, based on a number of reports, uh, were the sites of um, NSA surveillance within the United States. There's 18 of them there. We did a study of the traffic that we had in our database of, uh, uh, to see whether in, uh, U.S. traffic would likely be intercepted if it, um, what the chances of it was of being intercepted in one of those 18 places. And it was over 90%, actually it was 99%, but I don't believe it's quite that, um, that amount. But what this says is that you only need interception points in very few places, like 18 out of all of the United States, and you can capture basically 100%. Um, and in Canada, that number would be smaller, um, a half a dozen or so would capture you know, over 90% of, of, of internet traffic, whatever, whatever that happens to be. And then, and then the next question is, is, can you tell whether your packets go through those places? And um, I'll cut a long story short, but, but we do this by trick, by encouraging people, and I hope you will consider this, installing a bit of software that, called TraceRoute software that builds our database, and it records the set of routers that your packets um, take uh, as it hops across the internet to whatever the destination it, it, it is, and, we, and then we analyze those and try to locate physically, geographically, those, those routers and then we draw these um, maps as a result. So for instance, th this, these are all of the, well actually it's the selections, not all of them, um, of the routes in that database that's originated in British Columbia that had a, U a Canadian destination, in other words, they were um, you know, domestic traffic and they uh, passed through the United States. And then these are the routers, or, or, the, the, or the ISPs or the carriers that were involved and you can look at each route in particular to see which um, uh, which they are. And you'll see that, if you read it, that there are, there are quite a number of ones that won't be household names, but they are the major uh, internet carriers around the world. So for instance, in this case, um, well, Pier 1 is a big Canadian one, it's the largest um, backhaul, uh, uh, backbone carrier, but Hurricane Electric, for instance, um, N-Layer, Level three, uh, cogent uh, often appears. We'll see cogent in this one. Um, uh, this is Telus. Um, and there's its uh, boomerang traffic. Um, and here's a, a sample, small sample of the uh, domestic Canadian traffic to federal government websites, i.e., websites that end with gc.ca. And um, this is, I think, particularly disturbing in the sense that it means that Canadians cannot communicate with their federal government, and this applies also to provincial governments, although less so, I think, uh, without exposing their traffic to the United <coughs> States. Um, this is not just a privacy problem, I would say. It's, it's a national sovereignty problem. If a, a nation, you know, a... You know, a, a, a you know, sort of legally constituted group cannot maintain effective control over its own infrastructure, 
it makes itself vulnerable to the other power, in this case, particularly <coughs> the United States, and I think there's quite a number of reasons to think that um, Canadians uh, would be at risk. Mm -hmm. And also, um, not shown here, is, is that all of our traffic internationally to other countries basically goes to the United States. At least, uh, I'd say, 85%, if not more. We don't have any submarine um, fiber optic cables on the Pacific coast. So to get to Asia, you know, you have to go through the U.S. On the Atlantic side, there's some that go into Halifax, but most of our traffic to, to, to Europe um, goes, uh, goes through the United States. So, so we're, that the, the video that you just saw of the, uh, the railway in the 1967, I mean, that was just such a huge investment um, to maintain a kind of national infrastructure to connect the you know, country. But now that our infrastructures are invisible, our, they, it seems that we are prepared to actually not um, rely on, uh, we're not to have our own infrastructure. We do not, we, there's, there's fiber across the country um, actually following the, the, those rail routes uh, from the 1860s. Um, but the ownership of, of them means that um, that goes to the south. Uh, this is, uh, you probably can't see that a bit. Um, this is a, a chart that was prepared um, just recently uh, by uh, CIRA, the Canadian <coughs> Internet Registration Authority. So if you've, if you've registered with .ca, then you've, um, then you've gone through CIRA. And the Packet Clearinghouse, which is an internet research um, uh, organization in, uh, in San Francisco. And they analyze where the various ISPs, uh, the carriers, where they peer with each other, where they s exchange traffic uh, with each other. And um, they've highlighted in red um, a couple of com companies, um, TELUS and, and uh, Bell, um, which do not peer anywhere um, in Canada, but it just go back. The, the, these ones on the right are, are all um, non-Canadian outside of Canada. So they'll peer with others outside of Canada, but not inside Canada. And Shaw does a bit. It, it peers in Vancouver and Toronto. Um, those cities, those, the first ones that I mentioned, they all happen to be ones on that list of 18. I mean, not surprisingly, they're the largest uh, shipment centers. So in effect, um, TELUS and Bell Canada, we can argue about who really responsible for this, but if you are a subscriber of those and you are going to uh, many other uh, you know, sites um, that are um, have ISPs that are not those companies, they're basically uh, going to require you your data to go into the United States to Seattle or Chicago or New York, those are the three main ones, uh, before it will return. Um, if, you, if they appeared in Canada, in Canada in Vancouver, there's a uh, Vanex, um, Vancouver Internet Exchange, Torx is a longer-standing one in Toronto, or there's, there's growing numbers of them. If they appeared there, then um, it would at least avoid that and, and reduce that considerably. Um, unfortunately, even our governments, um, federal and, and uh, particularly in Ontario, um, they do not require that. Um, so um, they require, in effect, um, you to communicate with them to uh, go to the United States. So um, that's a, just a brief uh, take <coughs> by uncharacteristic. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm used to uh, <laughs> <laughs> about that. I'm so, um, so the question is like always. I think, what do you do about? It? Um, one of the problems of talking about this, um, about uh, NSA surveillance, um, of talking about. Uh, as Brett was about what, the, what Google and Facebook are doing, is, oh, I don't like that, but what can I do? And by the way, I see somebody taking photographs, so you're very welcome to do so, but I'll post these the slides on, 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 online. <laughs> I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll tweet the, um, the, the URL for that afterwards. So, but what do you do? And I'm afraid that, you know, listening to me and saying, you know, all of your data is intercepted, it's, it's, uh, it's surveilled um, by these secret powerful agencies. I mean, do you get depressed about that? I mean, <laughs> you could be. I mean, it is a challenge to our democracy. It's not just personal privacy. It's a, it's a challenge to our, the very institutional basis of a you know, liberal democratic society. Um, 
if you can't do something about it, if you just accept it, which is a very natural response, I and mean, who wants that kind of pain, um, you, you basically made it uh, a fait accompli, it's self-fulfilling prophecy, it becomes de facto. Right? And you know, now is a critical time, particularly after Edward Snowden's revelation, where we, where we can't be naive about it anymore. It's, it's like it's, stared, it's right in the face, it's right in our face. Um, there's no avoiding it. Um, uh, you can't say that you don't know, anyway. Um, and so, we have to do something. Otherwise, the question is, what will it take to reverse this kind of illegal, unconstitutional, very dangerous, unfettered surveillance that's embedded into the very infrastructure that we rely on for you know, so many of our activities? Right? It's, a, it's a huge problem. And as we have seen, and, and open media is, is part of you know, leading the, um, the advocacy around this, the response by states um, in Canada, the UK, and, uh, and, and in the US um, to these revelations is not to say, oh my gosh, you know, we have to rethink this and we have to really investigate and, and put in corrective measures. In the United States, they did that in the 1970s. Um, uh, after the after Watergate, uh, but but now they're actually stiffening the laws. They're they're bringing in laws that make retroactively things that were illegal and that they're now being caught out on um, within the within the law. And um, uh, Megan mentioned uh, Bill C fifty one. Before that, a few years ago, there was a lawful access bill that had been introduced again and again and again, and it had you know failed until finally it was brought in. Um, I guess in 2014. Um, and uh, so th the situation is actually worse uh, now than it was uh, with those uh, when Snowden uh, uh, revealed this. So it, we, we're not on a good path here. So what do you do? Um, my suggestions are very modest um, to begin with, uh, and in this case self-serving because I say, you know, have a look at our tool. <laughs> Um, see, at least uh, get a better sense of what's going on. Um, and uh, uh, when I say map your own roots, or your neighbor's roots, um, that's only because uh, until you actually contribute your own data, you can't actually see it. So you, but you can look at, at the, the roots um, that your, your neighbors, in the sense of live in the same city and have the same ISP, can take. And then uh, you can add um, your own roots, contribute them through um, to installing this uh, software. And as I mentioned, um, we're about to uh, launch uh, with Open Media's uh, <coughs> hope, uh, assistance, we hope, um, a, 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 a much uh, a much better looking uh, and more manageable site, um, somewhat less nerdy, uh, I think. <laughs> um, and that's the, the URL. Uh, we really welcome uh, feedback on that, so uh, give that a, a try. Uh, and that will at least um, help bring some transparency to this. I mean, more, um, I think more effectively, or in addition, um, there's a lot of things you can do about um, pr promoting privacy. And in this regard, around routing, and um, you know, encryption, of course, is always mentioned as, a, as kind of a solution, and you could be using TCP or Tor, and you know, the, I'm not going to uh, websites that have trackers and all that sort of thing. But around this question of routing and where your data actually travels and what jurisdictions it's in, um, then um, um, Bell and Telus particularly need a whole lot more pressure um, in order to make this an issue that they're going to respond to. Because um, until that, uh, they get pressure, they're, they're not going to change because it's, it's good for their business to make it hard for every all of their competitors um, to, uh, uh, to, to, to here more efficiently. Um, also, why are our governments going along with this? They should know better. Um, and that's another thing I would call for. Um, many of you may be at uh, universities um, or you know, work for firms um, that have a choice of ISPs. I was at the University of Toronto. Um, University of Toronto, sadly, like many um, other universities and schools, um, was, has outsourced its email service to Microsoft 365 um, or 
um, Google, and we did a study of, of those um, of, uh, in Canada, of uh, universities anyway, that are outsourced, because those are stored in the United States, and the, basically the university um, is, has handed over the entire digital archive to um, U.S. jurisdiction. I mean, this is, to me, it's just, it's, it's mind-boggling that a, that a responsible institution that has a duty of care would, would entertain such a thing for the, for sa for the um, just to save a few million dollars. You know, a, a price of, a cup of coffee per student per month is, um, is what um, they are, uh, they're saving by that, and, and they, they basically uh, mortgage their entire um, digital um, legacy. So, um, get your university. We, we stopped U, U, U of T from outsourcing faculty ma email, and now we have to get students back, but, but um, at least we stopped that. Um, the, o the, on the Office of the Privacy Commissioner and the Canadian um, Radio Television Telecommunications Commission have legal responsibilities to, to ensure that privacy is protected. At this point, they are not doing that in respect of where your data goes, partly because it's not talked about nearly as much as the social media one, but um, uh, filing complaints, um, registering uh, Open media is on the case. <laughs> Another thing for you to do, Laura. <laughs> More or less, it's him. Yeah, right. That's something you can do. And then in particular, um, Bill C-61 is the hot um, item right now. Uh, that needs to be rolled back. Um, that's not so much about surveillance, but what they can do with the data. But um, that's a place to start. And if we can make some progress on that, um, maybe we can roll back that lawful access um, legislation that actually gave them the legal authority to capture so much in the first place. So anyway, that's that's a very quick tour. But uh, thank you very much. Thank you.
Uh, mm -hmm. But one of the questions was, don't you think that Canada should increase all of its surveillance powers to keep up with that of the NSA? Like, basically, don't you think we should treat this like an arms race? Um, and, you know, we're losing the arms race, so shouldn't we just gear up and, and really fire, fight fire with fire? Uh, and I think what's really interesting is when you look at what happened with the Snowden revelations and all of these documents that came out, uh, people weren't mad that Canada was behind. Like, they were mad, they were like, man, we just can't keep up. Like, I wish we had that power, too. They are mad at what was happening. Um, and I think one of the things that's really cool about my job and our job at Open Media and having you people here and the people on the internet that are watching this um, is that those governments are listening. The reason that we are testifying at those committees is because they know that we have really big communities that are mad um, and that they care. And there's still politicians that are accountable to their constituents, and if enough of us speak up, to use a <laughs> commonly heard phrase in open media, um, they will hear us. But I think, you know, if we give up, it really is just accepting that we're okay with it. And even if it's a hard fight, and even if it's, you know, a really ugly long one, and we don't think we're going to win every battle, I don't think that just because it's hard, it's worth giving up on. Um, and I really do believe that. I think I'm in the right job for that. Um, <laughs> I think it fits what we're working on in open media. Um, but it's definitely big and it's scary. And I won't deny that. It definitely feels like, you know, we're we're starting at a disadvantage and behind because we didn't even know that a lot of these things were happening for so long, or we didn't have the proof. I think privacy is the hardest issue that we work on at Open Media because people know when their cell phone bill's too high. Um, they can definitely tell when their internet has been cut off, or they're being censored, or their content's being taken down. Uh, but it's a lot harder to tell when you're being spied on, um, and there's no ways to prove it um, really easily up front. And so I think. On that, this one we're starting a bit behind, but no, sorry, we're gonna page over. But no, <laughs> it's not too late, and I'm glad you're all here. And I Does anyone else have anything they want to add on that? Well, just at least agree with me. It's not too late. <laughs> well, not too late. I mean, I think one of the interesting things about, um, you know, like that we live in interesting times <laughs> is the. There's some. You're, you're probably all familiar with this science fiction writer Cory Doctorow, who does a lot of talking in, uh, in this space, and. He sort of describes um, one positive aspect of the moment we're in now is that like we, we sort of hit peak indifference. <laughs> um, yes. So, you know, in other words, there will never be a point at which um, people will be less interested. People will be less in <laughs> care less about their privacy, right? So, like we, we, we we've reached that point. Um, so I guess we're we're kind of like fishing for positive things in there, but I think that y you know one of the Sorry. things. You know, like in making that presentation tonight, is like, wow, that all happened really, really quickly. And so I think that there's also the ability to, to um, see really rapid uh, responses to this and, and, and alternatives. Um, so, no, I don't think it's too late. And in fact, um, <laughs> it's like kind of a good time to be somebody who cares about privacy, right? Yeah, <laughs> it really is. Absolutely. Um, Andrew? Yeah, I mean, just on the, first of all, on the positive side, I, I mean, a lot of this is actually quite interested and fun to do. So if you can find Says some weird, yes, <laughs> but, but but there's all kinds of ways I think, um, and people have to find their own of of making the the, the sort of the, the struggle rewarding in itself a bit by doing it with people you like and like hanging out with. I mean, that's that's one of the the, the big things. Um, the other is is that while it looks kind of bleak, I mean, this is by far the. Uh, is far from the from the worst uh, uh, situations that you know citizenry have faced over the last few hundred hundred years. In fact, some would say this is relatively mild uh, compared to world wars and you know um, quite a number of things that we've we've um, collectively uh, pulled ourselves out of through collective action. And um, so we have to find ways in which we can turn this moment um, uh, this off of, of indifference. And um, I think Trump has, has helped this greatly, at least um, from what I'm reading in my own little bubble, because a lot of people are really concerned. And th it's bringing people together in ways that they haven't before thought of and take with an urgency that, um, that seems new, um, or at least uh, a, a renewal of that kind of, of urgency. Um, and it's very connected to all of those other uh, s struggles by various um, uh, groups 
uh, who are being victimized. Uh, surveillance and the ability of, of law enforcement and state security agencies is a critical part of whatever kind of turn to authoritarianism is going to uh, occur, or that certainly is building. And the apparatus that mm. I've been talking about here um, has been described by uh, Richard Clark, who's a, who's a cybersecurity advisor to five presidents in a row, as the apparatus of a police state. I mean, he's not a, he's not a critic or opponent of the NSA. I mean, he sort of worked with them and for them. But he's observed a few years ago, uh, um, 2014, that what has been created is a perfect apparatus for a police state, and that um, once it's turned on, it's very difficult to turn off, because how can you oppose it? So this, the struggle for, for privacy um, links up with an anti-surveillance and, um, and sort of democratization of our, of our infrastructures, links up to all of those other struggles. Um, and in particular, I would draw analogy to the, to the environmental movement, because um, for a lot of the environmental movement, um, the, the, the harms were very remote. Um, like global warming, for instance, um, it's very difficult to persuade people that you know driving a bit um, is going to destroy the earth. Um, a great achievement of the environmental movement um, back, um, well, I'd say in the 60s and the 70s, was to create the idea of an environment, a, a global ecology, for which everyone is, is sort of responsible, for which everybody depends, and which everybody should take, take care of, that we need to exert some collective husbandry over the, the, the physical environment because of the, the, the pathways of pollutants and, um, and things like carbon dioxide. Their effects accumulate over time and, and over space, but they affect us all. And I would say you could make a similar argument about our informational worlds. We are, we sort of live within them and we are constantly reproducing them through our activities. And we have collectively to take care of those, not just a personal privacy uh, problem, it's a collective problem of managing this uh, common resource that we all depend on and which is vital. And if we can make the same kind of leap that the environmental movement, I'd say, I mean, it hasn't been fully successful yet, but it is a powerful movement that has this imaginary of a globe, an ecosphere that we need we depend on, we need to take, take care of. We can do that around informational matters and our you know, communications technologies. Then I think um, we'll be in a much better place and, and, and you know, now is the best time um, to do something about it. And I, and I think I've a lot of hope, I have a lot of hope in that. But it requires action. So not too late, not too late, not too late. Chris, you well, have anything to add? Uh, you're like a bit contrarian, but I'm going to... Uh, <laughs> yeah. I will agree, it's not too late, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think the, I've got a whole bunch of notes on this, just that everybody's points are so great. Uh, one I'd say is I think at the end of the day it's a political football. So when we look when C-51 hit the floor in Ottawa, uh, the Conservative government kind of threw that out, this huge omnibus bill, and the NDP who were second in power at the time, and then the Liberals were I think uh, tertiary opposition. It was really surprising to see the Liberals support that and endorse it. It was kind of shocking to me when their role was to oppose it. And um, as I started to look into that, it turns out the off-the-record comments I've received, which actually the, uh, the liberal support came from a woman here in Vancouver, Joyce Murray, mm -hmm. which actually got me moving into politics a bit, for those who are familiar. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, it was basically to make people aware that Joyce Murray and Vancouver Quadra championed the liberal party to support this. And, and it was really confusing. And the thing I got off the record, and not from Joyce Murray, uh, is that the liberal party uh, decided that if and when the next terrorist attack happens, they don't want to be responsible in the House of Commons to say, well, we denied this bill, because the Conservatives would be like, oh, we would have solved it all and stopped it, of course, if C-51 came in, but because they rejected it. So the decisions that we're making are basically around handling the political football of if and when the next terrorist attack happens. So we need to think about that in our rhetoric or our conversations with the political leaders who are deciding where the priorities lie. Um, I think a great example of that is our neighbors to the south right now with the political climate, who's kind of trumping up, if you will, the kind of uh, anxiety around terrorism. If and when a terrorist attack happens on Canadian soil or U.S. soil, say this week, God forbid, uh, or in the next couple of months, it's like the we've never seen a terrorist attack not create new 
uh, surveillance laws or terrorism laws. For example, when the Boston bombing happened, uh, the Harper government passed new laws. Uh, so like, governments are known to capitalize on these atrocities. Uh, and they're never for our benefit, and they're never, uh, they're, they're always, in my perspective, letting the terrorists win by passing these bills. So I think we need to think about our discourse in terms of how do we collectively choose, or do we collectively choose, to prioritize on other things. So for example, if we look at what the national security apparatus costs in Canada, I would argue most of us would probably agree that you know making sure everybody has access to clean drinking water in Canada probably a better use of our resources or um, you know ending uh, law enforcement abuse which is prolific in Canada both on the abuse side and uh, in the homicide from police I mean we actually have more Canadians die from police in Canada than from terrorist attacks so why do we have but how much money are we spending on solving that problem and so I think something like that is worth us considering on what we determine as our priorities in making Canadians safe and healthy and living at a great uh, kind of life. And I think that the phrase I came up with that I'm proud of and I hope it carries is privacy is consent. I think whenever people say privacy is dead, it's like you're basically arguing that consent is dead. Because I think that every individual should have choice. Do I want my picture here? Do I want this quote here? Whatever it is, those things that you want to protect, I feel that you as an individual should have that autonomy to choose. And so whenever you are okay with an organization removing your privacy, you're saying I'm okay to no longer choosing to consent. So hopefully if I get one phrase that remains, it's privacy is consent. So then if you're going to argue privacy is dead, that's saying that you choose that consent is dead. I'm going to tweet that right after I get on here. <laughs> pretty sure David already yeah. All right, <laughs> perfect. Well, there you go. It's out there in the world then. Um, I was going to ask, you know, I have nothing to hide, so do I have anything to fear? But I think that we'll just ride right past that one because you guys have done a really good job of explaining exactly what we do all have to fear. It, even if we don't feel like we have anything to hide, you've all seen my Facebook page and I'm still a fearful. Um, I have so one comment. If anybody says that, I love this because I'm actually, I got commissioned to write a book on it, so I've been thinking about it a lot. But one of the entertaining things is anybody who's ever said I have nothing to hide, I ask them to take off their clothes in front of me, but before they do that, to give me their credit card and their driver's license. And to this day, I've never had one person do that. Uh, I also will offer, if you feel you have nothing to hide, I will pay for a CCTV camera system to go to your house, and you just have to set up in your bathroom and your bedroom, and I set up the HDTV feed to your Wi-Fi, and I'm going to have it stream online forever. I've never had anybody accept that yet. So if you feel you have nothing to hide, come talk to me. I would like to meet the one person who actually has nothing to hide. <laughs> Great offers uh, all around there, for sure. Um, so the other question I'm going to ask before I open it up to the audience is, uh, you know, we kind of touched on both sides of uh, the privacy issue today. We touched on commercial privacy a lot with what Brett was talking about, the way, um, you know, we're tracked online by a lot of different companies, uh, potentially people that we don't even know are tracking us, and also on the government side, how we're surveilled by governments and how potentially uh, we might not even know that either. But also uh, now, thanks to some people, we do know a little bit more about it. But my question is, do you, any of you find one of those kind of aspects more concerning or scarier than the other? Is it, does commercial privacy keep you up at night where government surveillance doesn't, or is it all just a big mess? Lobbing that out there. I'm going to let someone else go first. So just, just a different problem space. It's different attack vectors from an information security <laughs> perspective. So what's the government's going to do with it versus what a corporation's going to do with it? You know, there's documented mm -hmm. cases of the NSA uh, releasing data they have to the media to release to uh, against someone, for example. So that's one use case. If you're a dissident, for example, it's not going to work in your favor, whatever documentation they have. Whereas in the private sector, it's typically used for other purposes, uh, such as advertising is a very prominent one. Uh, and then there's the common uh, potential use cases that aren't really illegal, such as, um, or it's hard to get caught, I should say, is to, uh, uh, for say, uh, employment. So you're going to get rejected your next appointment because we've seen that you've been searching for cancer treatment uh, or something like this. Um, so uh, insurance and jobs in the future are going to be uh, impacted, I would suggest, based on your uh, search history. And of course, the, the hotter one will be DNA related uh, coming down the pipe shortly. It's, it's a hard question because um, one of the weird things about, yeah, one of the weird th hard things about talking about this stuff, I find, is one, you know, we're, we're trying to sort of incite curiosity in folks and sort of like here are some stories, but one of the things that like we don't show in these presentations is like 
a lot of this stuff doesn't actually work. Like they're collecting all this data on us to either like build a profile of us online or to be able to catch terrorists. And it, it does not actually hold true that the more data that you collect about people, the better, the more safe that we're going to be or the more effective you're gonna be able to sell your goods and services. That's actually just, I don't know if that's actually going to play out, right? Um, so the, the other thing about like collecting all this data is you just don't actually know how um, that's going to be harmful in the future, which is why you know, like I totally agree with the environmental movement metaphors, and some, sometimes one way to think about all this data is it's like, it's like toxic waste. Like you just never actually know. Like it's, it's really impossible to get rid of, and it's really impossible to know the harm that it's going to cause. Like one example of that is um, you know, after the fall of the sort of Soviet Union, there was all of these um, records that were collected about um, people that the state had suspected um, were homosexuals. Um, and you know, obviously, when some of the, this was this was in the Ukraine, I believe, or it was either the Ukraine or, or Eastern Germany. And after um, you know the, those um, countries moved to more democratic systems, there was a movement to so like, hey, we want to delete this. This is not appropriate information to be carrying around all these citizens w without their consent. And they could not find this information. So it's like that last, it's like that last scene in Indiana Jones where there's like, ah, where, where, where is all this stuff? You, you just don't know down the line where, where this inform if, if this is all being collected, how it could be potentially used and how to properly dispose of it. So it's like this um, nuclear waste and so much of this information is being hoovered up. Shoot um, into space. Shoot into space. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can provide an unequivocal answer uh, to that question of what is important. Is I think state surveillance is because the state has um, much more coercive power, um, and it also has takes all of that access to all the commercial information anyway. So um, and doesn't quite go the other way around. Um, and we see examples of people's lives that have been thoroughly ruined if not mm -hmm. killed. And whether it's accurate or whether it sort of works for the stated purposes and it doesn't, um, it's, uh, there's a lot of good reasons to challenge this kind of massive big data approach to achieving actual security. And that's one of the, I think, potentially powerful arguments you can make against this, is that it doesn't actually work from in the stated ways. Um, the other one, of course, is that the risks from terrorism um, are much smaller, I mean, they're minuscule compared to a whole lot of other um, risks that we put up with, and so we have to have a, you know, an, an adult discussion about risks mm -hmm. um, related to, to privacy, and if we put it in proportion, I think a lot of the driving force would, uh, for these kinds of uh, surveillance would, would go away. But, um, you know, this, this, because the state is acting in this area, not all, all areas, um, of course, is acting in a largely unfettered way, in an unaccountable way, it is extremely dangerous uh, to both individuals and, as I was saying earlier, to democratic institutions. Um, the best example of that um, is when uh, the head of the, the director of, of national intelligence, James Clapper, maybe you all know this, but but uh, was asked uh, in the Senate, um, do you, sir, um, or does uh, the NSA uh, collect information on millions of Americans? And he said, no, no, sir, um, not wittingly. And two months later, um, uh, Snowden, you know, did the goods. And he he did not resign. He was not called to resign. He he only retired just um, this last year. So completely unaccountable, lying under oath to you know the elected body is was considered to be an unspeakable well a, well a crime that you you couldn't survive. So we have here a part of the state. Being acting with in, with impunity, and so that to me is just um, is is well is, is completely unacceptable, and that's why I think it's so dangerous. And not to say that Google and Facebook, um, you know, don't pose a threat. Aren't also scary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. but uh, as we know, this you know they they get you know, the state has access to, to Google it anyway. anyway yeah. yeah, I think Clapper's a good candidate for your CCP. Program if you're <laughs> <laughs> uh, the offer's out there if he's watching <laughs> wants to reach out. Where are you doing Can you tweet Jane? <laughs> um, I think it's kind of a trick to me because they they don't exist in isolation of one another. Yeah, of um, and so I think traffic. yeah, like definitely based on everyone, everyone's points. Um, I am more 
scared of the consequences of the government having that information because they have the power to arrest and detain and deport people and have the interception um, and interference capabilities that uh, corporations don't have in the same way. They don't have that legal jurisdiction to make people's physical lives a living hell. Um, and you know, you look at Maher Arar, which is one of the best examples in Canada of just how wrong this can go and how much it can actually harm someone's life. Uh, you know, that wasn't Facebook doing that. Mm -hmm. That wasn't Google doing that. That was a government doing that with bad information. Um, but governments don't just get their information from themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're seeing a lot of great things on transparency reports and ways that corporations are trying to be more open about what they're doing in cooperation with governments. But that doesn't mean that they're not getting that information from private corporations. That doesn't mean that they're not intercepting it um, in the ways that those corporations are protecting their own um, information. And it also doesn't mean that the information the governments or those corporations have is accurate. Mm -hmm. And so when it's inaccurate information, it can be twice or three times or four times as dangerous because, you know, mistaken identities and all kinds of those things where you see people that are on no fly lists that it's not even the right person um, and there's no way to validate that that six month old baby is not the person on the no fly list because they have the same name and it's just one of those things that people are dealing with on an ongoing basis that keeps coming up um, but I think a lot of that information comes from these sort of other platforms and the ways they get the information so it's a nasty net but they're all well set they're all working together and <laughs> yeah. it's all coordinated it's all coordinated yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I want to open it up now to the audience. Is there anybody who has any questions that are popping to their mind? If you don't, I have more questions. Than I'll leave it, so. Sure, we'll take back. Uh, I, I just have a question in general for all the panelists. Um, <clears throat> how do you see the importance of defaults uh, when it comes to uh, these different areas? Because I'm fairly new to this topic, but what little bit I've read about it seems to be that the baby wins either for the people or for other interests, corporate or government, and um, defaults keeps coming up as a key theme. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it's huge. I mean, um, you know, um, we can quibble about this, but, um, you know, WhatsApp introduced end-to-end -end encryption um, by default um, within um, that platform, which just, like, <coughs> overnight gave, you know, hundreds of millions of people access to end, end encryption. So it's, yeah, it's a really good observation that like there's small steps that um, people can take to um, to make that true. And obviously that's been, Facebook was actually compelled to um, change some of those defaults based on, I can't remember if it was, um, it wasn't, it was like a trade uh, area that they had run afoul of. There's the Trade Commission, yeah. Federal Trade Commission mm -hmm. uh, in the United States. Um, Right? The FTC, I think. Or the FTC, yeah, yeah. they had run afoul of the yeah. FTC, so the FTC sued them and uh, forced them to, um, you know, you, you probably have noticed that over time Facebook actually has become better about saying like, hey, you're about to post a photo, um, would you like to post this just to your friends, or would you like everyone to be able to see this, or do you, do you want some, some controls? And I think that's, it's, it's interesting that like, to, to the earlier question, that like co companies can be more easily moved because there is that market aspect that people are saying like, hey, our, our cultural norms are now demanding that we want some more privacy, and so um, maybe there needs to be a market response to that. Um, so yeah, I think that defaults are, are huge. Anybody else? Um, yeah, the Facebook is an entertaining one to me. It was the first time I created my, put my real name on the internet was 2007 to help a group out of Ottawa called CIPIC. Uh, who was interested in filing a complaint against Facebook, and they have a real name policy in their terms of service, which says if you don't use your real name, um, then um, you know you're not complying. Which would mean if we went to court and I got caught using a fake name for research, it would have got thrown out. So it was an exciting time for me, my first time I used my real name on the internet. <laughs> um, uh, Anne Kabukian was the privacy commissioner of Ontario, and she notoriously uh, set up a relationship with Facebook, which I found really weird. Um, a, because that wasn't really her jurisdiction, private sector at the time. But uh, she built a flyer saying how great Facebook was in social media. And on the back page, it said seven privacy options that you can get on Facebook. Uh, so how great are they that they give you seven options? But when I looked, six of those were off by default. Mm -hmm. And so it was just an interesting one that we have the commissioner of Ontario at the time 
um, recommending Facebook for all of its uh, all of its greatness. I think uh, the other one that I think we see both politically in governments and in private sector is um, kind of go out strong, and then people can argue back some of those defaults. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. see it with you know Trump in the U.S. right now, right? I think the common belief is like. Something bad, you know, he'll get impeached or something, and then it will be Pence who will be like the the less scary one. But by then, he'll have done so much that anything Pence does after the fact is like, eh, it's not as bad as it was, kind of thing. And that's the the general consensus. So it's like, and so Facebook and any kind of big player. I'm not meaning to just pick on Facebook, but any big player can make that conscious decision and say, well, let's just turn it all off. And if they fight and win a couple, well, that you know, that's a thing. I'm gonna grab another question. They're important to say. <laughs> to answer. Any other questions? Well, I have a theoretical question, but just about uh, choosing an ISP to bring, do the boomerang into the U.S. Like, is that something that that even if they have, if they mean they are peering here, could they still be bouncing? Like, let's say shot, like I'm in Vancouver, but could my, does that mean that my data is not going to go to Seattle first, or could it if they just decide that they want to? Oh, yeah. And how do you? <laughs> yeah, no. Can, can they can they actually control it themselves, even if they promise to? And then can I trust that? Um, at this point, um, uh, ISPs are not making a big deal about this, um, and unfortunately, even those that do peer locally tend to be the smaller ones, which mean that when they have to get to the bigger ones, then they they use as their their long haul backbone. Um, uh, uh, carriers, transit carriers are called, uh, they then go with big American ones to get their data back and forth. So it's, it's a messy situation. I, I would love to be able to say, you know, go with tech savvy, or, which in, in many ways is, uh, I would say, is much preferable than, than others in terms of privacy protection. Um, but this is something I'm going to be trying to persuade open media that they might want to make a campaign about because they, they've got a thing in for the, for, um, the incumbent carriers uh, for very good reason. And this is another area which I think um, they should go after. Um, so I would say if people make that an, an issue, if, if they're concerned about where, they, where, they, where their data goes, um, that they look around um, and let their carrier know that this matters to them and they support campaigns to, to reduce um, exposure of Canadian data to, to the U.S., then I think over time that you'll, you know, that, that would be possible. Um, I also think the CRTC has an important role in the OAK, on the, on the Office of the Privacy Commissioner has an important role too in, in, uh, in testing this. But this is early days. Uh, for for the issue of routing, uh, for data storage, it's better uh, better supported. And in British Columbia, uniquely, at least government held personal data has to be stored within in Canada. They have not yet gone to the point that they have to route it within Canada. No other province has this, that same degree. Um, and I think um, that idea of data localization should be uh, an important principle that's that's looked at. If data doesn't have to go to another jurisdiction, then, then don't let it go there. Yeah. yeah, I think the thing that's hard about it is even if you switch carriers, if there is a carrier that automatically sort of by default goes through the US when it connects to other carriers, if people are using that one and you're trying to access them, you yeah. have to go through them, which yeah. means that you kind of, you can start in Canada and then, yeah. you know, Ballard tells will send you the really long route, um, which is really frustrating. It also, like on a really basic level, if anyone's a gamer, it just slows your internet yeah. down. Like there's some actually really basic implications yeah. of it, is, which in some ways relate to people more than privacy, which mm -hmm. is just like, oh, that was that lag. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, hmm. But I think to Andrew's point, like the more people understand it's an issue, it actually requires the infrastructure of the internet in Canada to be changed. And it requires investment in that infrastructure, which I mean, we're an organization that's campaigning for faster internet everywhere across the country. Um, and high speed quality access for everyone. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get that investment in infrastructure. Um, and a lot of that is because they don't think there's the demand. And so it's, again, that same case of really yeah. proving that people care about it. Right. But it's political will, not economics. The actual yeah. economic costs yeah. are relatively small, particularly compared to the uh, CPR railway. Uh, yeah. It's, 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 it's minuscule in comparison. Yeah. Sure. 
in the victory. Oh. Um, I just have an observation and also a challenge in a way to the room, to everyone, and also just my own experience. Uh, background, um, I used to work for Telus, so I know quite a bit about routing and data. Correct me if I've said anything wrong. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. Um, I won't go into details about it, but um, there's a lot of money involved in actually creating the infrastructure. Sure. Um, Canadians typically uh, support a lot of U.S. companies. So for Canadian companies to invest the money to put that infrastructure, it doesn't make a lot of sense to mm -hmm. them. So that's why they partner up and do stuff in the States. Yeah. For example, right now, I use a BlackBerry. It's a Canadian company. But how many people in this room actually have a BlackBerry? Great question. What year is it? <laughs> 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 what year is it? But BlackBerry is going out of business mm. because a lot of Canadians are not even supporting a Canadian company. Mm. I would argue if the RC if they didn't give the RCMP their global key ten years ago, there'd probably be more BlackBerry users in Canada. At least myself. But, but iPhone separate issue. Are worse than a BlackBerry because if you have an iPhone, I could actually tap into your phone, knowing what we did in the industry when I was in Satel. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect, I think, is complacency. People take freedom of speech, freedom of information, and freedom of accessing technology and everything for granted. So by virtue of that, people just don't say, oh, there's no consequence, so why should I do it? Like if this was an open forum and they'd come out, how many people would come out to, to this forum and participate compared to something that will say, hey, you know, we're going to raise taxes. Like in terms of priority wise, they look at it and go, eh, nothing happened. It's not something that hits the wallet. So for me, the only way that this time things or people like tell us will listen from what I've learned having been in the industry and having worked for them is by you actually utilizing your actual dollars and how you're gonna spend it. That's the only time the companies will listen. Okay. Otherwise you'll just be beating around the bush. But if you say, I'm not gonna renew my contract because of the privacy they will listen. Any response from that? Yeah, well, I immediately agree that anything in the private sector, your money talks. So unless you're willing to actually let them know why you're not buying it too. So I mean, if you just switch to the Shaw in the case of British Columbia without telling them, then that's not, they're not sure why you're switching. But if you make sure it's documented that I am switching because of, say, privacy, it will eventually have an impact at scale. Um, for those who aren't familiar, though, in Canada, we really only have two ISPs per province. So we have one DSL provider, which is the old copper pair phone line system type, and then there's the um, fiber optic, uh, or sorry, coaxial, um, such as Shaw in, in British Columbia. But they basically uh, got the rights to the, that infrastructure in Canada like decades ago, and so um, they are not really motivated politically to peer with each other. I would argue there's a lot of people eager that if they would want to peer and create, uh, create IX points around Canada, and I know Sierra has started doing some community ones, we will see it. But right now, there's no motivation for Shaw and Telus in British Columbia, for example, to want to peer to each other. So instead, they make the conscious choice to peer with an American provider, which forces all Canadians' internet traffic through the US, which is what Andrew's great tool is um, demonstrating to all Canadians, whether or not we choose to take action from that. but. Without hesitation, it's not a, uh, an economic driver that is the bottleneck. It is 100% the uh, regulator uh, mandating peering between ISPs in Canada, and if they chose to do that. And it's important to know in the regulator model, for example, CRTC, it's notorious. Um, I forget, you've got the, the term that is... Regulatory capture. The regulatory <laughs> capture, which is basically like... If you're working as an executive at TELUS and you want to take a couple of years off, you can work in the CRTC, the regulator, for a couple of years, do your two-year stint, and then they almost always go back into the industry. So if you watch anybody who works at CRTC who's choosing how we're going to regulate internet peering in Canada, um, it's, it's kind of incestuous in the industry as far as who's making these decisions. And so, again, that's a political will decision, I think, that needs to take place. I want to just, oh, go ahead. If I can just... Um, Point out one of the other things that we've done with X maps I didn't talk about, it, but it's reflected in these stars on the right. There's transparency there. You might not be able to read that. That's basically tri privacy transparency. We score 
um, the major, Cana major minor Canadian carriers on in terms of how much do they tell you about what they do with their data and protect it, and then we give stars. Mm. Um, now, uh, Shaw gets only two, TELUS actually gets um, five, I think, um, Rogers, and, and they are beginning to respond, uh, at least some of the carriers, like Rogers in particular, um, Kajiko, another um, one, and, and TELUS, in, uh, tech savvy in particular, they, they, they at least changing the way in which they tell you about um, their practices, but until people actually look at that and, and decide um, in the cases where they can um, choose carriers, which is uh, very, very limited. It's usually, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an We're oligopoly. Okay. It's an yeah. Ol yes, no, yeah. Um, then um, then they, will, they will change, as, as, you're, as you're suggesting, so. Okay, I want to get one more question that. from the audience before I lob a softball. Right there. Um, yeah, mine's a, just a little bit of a question. I think it's an interesting juxtaposition we're at where you're comparing commercial um, providers and the government and saying that maybe the government is the more dangerous entity uh, when you juxtaposition them. And talking about, say, uh, Apple's public, we're not going to unlock that iPhone versus WhatsApp making the default choice. A large part of this is commercial companies wanting to look good. Uh, I just want to ask you about, there are certain, for example, WhatsApp did it because the founders of WhatsApp were from countries where they were paranoid about privacy. That's a large part of the thing, but also it's to look good. So. My question really is about how do these little gatekeepers, like these organizations, um, have so much more power than public voice, um, which is crazy. But like, do you think that the government versus these commercial entities is something that's going to be interesting to watch coming up in the future, and uh, rather than public opinion, which is very indifferent right now? Uh, yes, it is going to be very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think. Apple versus FBI case is a really good example of that, where that became so um, well publicized because of public opinion and because of public interest. Mm. Like, the government trying to access an iPhone is such a non-story. <laughs> like, it's just not an it's not an interesting story until all of a sudden. Everyone in the U.S. is divided. Everyone is on one side or the other. It's a matter of national security versus civil rights. And as soon as that story really gets told in that way and there's a really, really engaged public on it, then you see that opposition. And I think uh, that was a really good example of Apple, you know, you can interpret their motivations however you want. And you can say that it's because they wanted to do the right thing. You can say it's because they wanted to protect their users. You can say it was a total PR stunt. It doesn't matter why they did it. They were forced into that position because of public opinion. And when you know you feel like people don't really have that clout against governments, well, those corporations can. And people can too. And people can impact both of those sides. And it's a really interesting way to look at it. I, I, that case to me was just so interesting to see how like a year later people are still talking about like well should the government get access to everyone's phones and what does that look like and can they get into my phone and and not really understanding how it was resolved and how did they get into the <coughs> phone and you know was it legal wasn't it and <coughs> like are you kidding me they could it's not that exciting for them to try and get into a phone they do it all the time but because that one couldn't happen on the terms they wanted it and it was so well publicized um, you can really see how given the right sort of political storm, those companies have a huge voice, the government has a huge voice, and every single person with a vested interest can actually really make a difference. And, and so yes, that was a long way to say yes, I'm very interested in seeing how those two play against each other, but uh, I think from my perspective, and again, I come from a community-based organization that is about empowering people and citizen voices, um, I think the really interesting thing is how we as concerned citizens and as a public impact both sides. Um, and there's ways for us to impact both and play them against each other too. Um, and the more that you see, you know, <coughs> what's up implementing encryption, it's like, okay, well, you know, government employees, are they required to use encryption technologies and when are they and when aren't they and how does that impact it? And when they start to see how other groups are doing it, it kind of can keep spiraling into a bigger and bigger tornado that we can use to our advantage. You're, you're, you're touching on this, um, 
basically this theory called the pathetic dot theory that um, uh, was kind of made famous in this book uh, called Code is Law. Um, and the author of this book, guy Lawrence Lessig, proposed that there's four forces that regulate the internet, and uh, we're the pathetic dots in the middle of that, which are um, <laughs> norms, laws, markets, and code. And they, they're, they interplay with one another. So if somebody makes a change in the code, like with WhatsApp, that creates a market pressure that all of a sudden, you know, other makers of uh, messaging apps are going to have to rush to compete with them to offer the, the same services. So in, in that, it, it can move that way. Um, it could also mean that, like, all of a sudden, um, the regulators are going to have to respond to that. Um, when they respond to it, it might shift cultural norms. Um, when Open Media does a big campaign that shows like 200,000 people support a thing, that moves a needle another way. So. These are all the forces that regulate um, that question of what we can do. There's many things that are involved in there, so it's not like one or the other. It's how do these, you know, forkets, forces of the market, of regulation, of norms, and then code, the stuff that we write, which is like why the stuff that what Andrew's doing is really, really important, um, and ways to push back. Great. All right, it's my turn to lob a softball, and I'm going to be ready. You're not supposed to tell people to No, 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 it's fine. You're all here. Yeah. 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 You put this like, thing in your yeah. press pad. Yeah. 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 All right, all right. <laughs> Anyways, let me ball my softball. So each of you get one minute to hit it, OK? Uh, what is the one thing that us pro-privacy folks should do right after we leave this, uh, this, this space tonight? What's the one thing that we should do? Download signal. Yeah. Download <laughs> signal. You didn't even need one minute. You can't all say the same thing. Chris. <laughs> I go last and I all, right, all right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> uh, I'm going to assume you're all part of Open Media's community, but I would definitely say, you know, if you're into social media, follow us. Marie behind the phone over there is our social media guru. Uh, she shares all kinds of good stuff. But uh, I think pick the thing that captures your imagination tonight. If it's corporate surveillance and data tracking, if it's government surveillance, if it's encryption, whatever it is that excites you and tell the person that matters on that issue that it matters to you. If it is the fact that you don't like the government is spying on you, tell your MP and tell the minister responsible. Um, you know, we have all kinds of ways you can talk to Minister Goodale if you want to know how to tell public safety all about what you think about C-51 and national security. Um, your MP of any political stripe is accountable to you as a constituent. And let me tell you, they don't hear from you enough. And when they do hear from you, it has a really strong impact. Um, and we have all kinds of campaigns, so I would say, Talk to your MP, and also, because I can't help it, when we launch this crowdsourcing evaluation of the national security consultations, one, check it out, and two, uh, take part, because I think it's really cool for us to, as a community, hold the government accountable for what they're doing. All right. I got lots of things, sorry. Well, I've already so given fun. one answer, which is to try out a new site, but that's <laughs> entirely self-serving, and I don't actually think that's the most important thing you should do. It's just the thing that I would like you to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, what Laura is saying, I think, is very important. Um, talk to other people, um, your MP, of course, but also people who you know or you have some connection with who don't, who you don't agree with, but to help them understand this, because it's only by getting outside the kind of you know bubbles that um, that Brett was talking about um, that this is going to actually uh, change. Um, it has to be much wider, and um, so if you can make this this issue um, a matter of importance to other people who aren't in this um, field already, that will be a tremendous um, of value, so. Great. Last word. I have one minute. One minute. I'm trying okay. to I guess, so I, I just generally like helping people, and so I will say, I'll use my, give my Twitter account away for anybody interested, which is CQWWW. And the reason I give it is I'd like after this is to ask all of your questions that you think of tomorrow or later and ask, uh, and the reason I say that is I want to improve technical literacy around privacy and security. Uh, a quick example is we just talked about the iPhone, for example, that case, like, there's no debate from a technical perspective. If the FBI wanted in the phone, they could have got in the phone, but it was, it was architected in the media as if it's like this really tough thing to do and we need legislation. It was an FBI game, which to start the conversation, should that be an easier thing for them to get access to, which we're hearing about in Canada. Same with WhatsApp, it sounds good that they do end-to-end -end encryption, but still all of that uh, metadata is going through Facebook servers, and so it's not to uh, now a trusted authority. And so um, my one thing I would recommend, which I've never recommended before, uh, but if you really want to nerd out, every computer has a firewall. Uh, go in and lock everything on your computer when you get home so no packets can get off your computer. 
no packets can come into your computer. It would be it's going to be totally useless if you do that. And if you do that, pardon? No, do it just in software. But if you actually did that and then only allowed traffic when you know what that traffic is you need to allow in or out, the uh, knowledge you would get from completing that exercise would introduce you to all of the things that like IX Maps is actually logging and all the things that we're campaigning against because it would involve understanding a packet sniffer like Wireshark, for example, and how does the internet actually work. So simply by turning your firewall to block everything in and out and then only opening packets when you can say, I want to surf the web, so allow outbound 480, for example. I think that would be the la biggest learning lesson that I would love to hear. If one person did that from here, I would feel awesome. And on, for instructions on how to do that, you're going to tweet at Chris. And we'll make sure that you've got his Twitter handle afterwards, so you can just tweet up at him. Later on tonight, you're going to have lots of uh, questions about how to get the firewall on and off, but that's fine. You also, for it. you didn't <laughs> plug, watch the rest of Do Not Track. I would actually, pl okay, yes, do that. Um, <laughs> if, if, if everybody's going to plug, um, I work for Mozilla, so we make Firefox, uh, so you can use that. Um, and there is a private browsing mode, but I think one of the ways that I would encourage people to think about this is like almost like food. So if you, the, oftentimes if you really, really want to find the like locally sourced, um, ethical treated, where you actually know how this thing, uh, this food is, has come to you, you might actually have to pay for that. Um, but the net cost to you might actually, you might be saving yourself time. And there are a lot of examples of, uh, of ways that you can do that. So that's like maybe the app, uh, maybe the flashlight app for your phone that wants all of your contacts and wants to like sign you up to an ad network just to use a flashlight. Maybe pay a dollar for a flashlight. It's not that fucking much to pay a dollar for a flashlight, <laughs> right? Um, so I think thinking about ways that you can um, actually do that voting with your with your dollars that that gentleman was talking about, there's ways to do that that are, that, that are helpful for that and just like maybe have a think about what uh, permissions, like that's one, that's one tip. The permissions that apps are asking for be really critical. Why does this? Why does Angry Birds need to know this much information mm -hmm. uh, on my phone? Absolutely. I know there's still questions, but I'm sure you can harangue these people on the way out the door. I know all of them. They're all going to stop and ask you answer your privacy questions. But I do have a couple of things to say before we wrap up. And one of them is huge thank you to everybody who's come out tonight. Um, I learned a lot, and this is my job all the time. So I'm really, really happy that you were able to join us in person. It makes a big difference. So thank you so much. <laughs> so for people who are interested in doing a little bit more of this, uh, I have an exciting plug. Uh, we're going to have a crypto party uh, pretty soon. So Open Media is going to throw a crypto party. If you've never heard of a crypto party before, it's you come together and you learn how to encrypt your stuff. You learn how to do all sorts of cool privacy things. You learn how to use different tools. You connect with other people in the community who care about this issue. Uh, we don't have a date for it yet, so you're going to have to follow Open Media to find out when it's going to be. See, that was clever. Um, and uh, what we'll do is we'll let you guys know exactly where and when it's going to be, but it's going to be a really fun time. It's going to be our first time doing this, so bear with us as we work out the kinks. Uh, but we're really excited to start offering stuff like this uh, on, on a more regular basis. Um, as well, we're going to have a fun theme where you can you know, like dress like a private eye, or you know you can come dressed in your like cyberpunk 90s theme. Whatever it is that you want, it's going to be a really great time. Uh, keep an eye on Open Media Spaces to find out when exactly that's going to be and where we're going to do it. And finally, uh, there are t-shirts on your way out. If you're interested, they're on a sliding scale between 5 and $10. And you can also chat with Alex, who's just right there at the back, if you would like to volunteer. Alex is our volunteer and community engagement specialist. She's fantastic. She's brought in all sorts of great bloggers and people who help with our general inbox and people who help organize events. So there's tons of stuff that you can do to get involved if you're really interested. Um, and once again, just thank you all for coming tonight. It's been really great. Um, tweet at Chris. He'll tell you about your firewall. It'll be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. <laughs>